Well, what a great time of year. In spite of the weather and everything that's happened, we have so much to be thankful for. And God is so good. Uh, here, uh, we're going to continue with our Christmas series in 2022. We're going to be talking about part two of the Savior and salvation. So let's pray as we look into God's Word here today. Father God, just thank you so much for coming, for sending Jesus. Thank you for coming to be our Savior and our Lord. And we pray that your blessing will rest upon this time in your Word today, that you would instruct us and inspire us, help us to live productive Christian lives in light of the truths that we're going to be looking at. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at Matthew and specifically the angel coming to Joseph and what he says to Joseph and some of the applications of that. So if you have your Bible, you can turn open to Matthew chapter 1 and verses 18 through 25. Uh, We're going to begin reading that here today. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What a tremendous announcement this angel made to Joseph, that this child would save his people from their sins. Sometimes we think about what that must mean. How does he save his people from their sins? Well, we can think of a few different ways that the Lord saves his people from his sins. One is he saves his people from the penalty of our sins because he himself bore the punishment that we deserved. So he saves his people from the penalty of sin. He saves his people from the power of sin by giving us a born-again life where we have the Holy Spirit living in us who gives us the power to overcome sin when we choose to cooperate with him. How does he save his people from his sins? He saves from the penalty of sin. He can save from the power of sin. He can save from the inclination to sin. That's the process of sanctification. Justification is looking at the cross outside of us as the source of forgiveness. Sanctification is the cross doing a work inside of us to change us. And All of us who know the Lord Jesus have been changed. And so he changes the penalty of sin, the power of sin, the inclination to sin. These are some of the ways that that he changes us. And he changes the presence of sin. As you get to know the Lord, you're not comfortable in some settings that you were comfortable in before you came to know the Lord because you just don't want to be around that stuff anymore. You don't want to be present in uh, sins that maybe you were present in in the past. So he says, the angel says, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So if you're struggling with something, there's hope for you today. God's given us a savior who can save us from all these different aspects So what is the nature of sin? The nature of sin is separation. What did he actually save us from? The first thing that we might think about is separation. 
Our sins separate us from God, and our sins separate us from people that we love and care about. Uh, so, how did this sin even come into the world? Romans 5, 12 describes it. Therefore, just as through one man, speaking of Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so, spread, set, so death spread to all men because all sinned. This separation, you know, if you think back, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the Garden of Eden history, and before sin came into the world, Adam and Eve were just freely enjoying the presence of the Lord. But after sin, they wanted to separate themselves. They wanted to hide. And God eventually separated them from the garden. But, you know, sin causes separation. One of the primary meanings of sin in the Bible comes from a word that means to miss the mark. And when we are shooting at something and we miss the mark, you know, that, that is a, a good analogy of what the Bible means when it talks about sin. God sent us on a path that we were to hit the mark in terms of the morality of our lives, the choices we make, our desire to follow him. But sin, choosing sin, caused us to miss the mark, and all have missed the mark. Sin is the transgression of God's law, it's clear in Scripture, and that it relates to God's character is evident, too, in Scripture. Some theologians understand sin as the breaking of God's moral law, which is true. Others define sin in a little broader context, that anything in people which does not express or which is contrary to God's holy character. There's certainly truth in both these things, for God's law is a reflection of his character. Sin is a specific kind of evil. It's a rebellion against God, a violation of the law of God. Sin is also a principle or a nature that is inside of us as well as an act. Sin is an inclination that we have to be self-centered, and specific sins are the expression of that nature. Acts of sin spring from a nature that's inclined towards sin. And even after we're saved, the Bible talks about the battle between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh wants to follow its, what the Bible calls, lusts. And the spirit wants us to follow holiness in the pursuit of God. So what is sin? Sin is actually a profound self-centeredness. Sin is an exaggerated, I think I have a slide for this. Sin is an exaggerated love of self in which we elevate our will and our self-interests above God and his law in the committing of evil. It's an exaggerated love of ourselves. Isaiah chapter 53, 6 puts it like this. All of us, everyone in this room, everyone in this world, there's only one who never fit this category, and that was Jesus. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. That's what sin is. We're turning to our own way, wanting what we want independently of what we know God wants from our lives. Thankfully, the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Jesus. Selfishness is the essence of sin, is evident from the fact that all forms of sin can be traced to selfishness as their source. Why do we steal? Hopefully we don't, but if you do, why do we steal? <laughs> You just want something that someone else has that isn't yours. So you want it. It's a, a self-centeredness. You know, Jesus was so perfect. John 5, 30. 
I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The first Adam was a disobedient son. The second Adam, Jesus, was an obedient son. He only wanted to do what the Father wanted him to do. And it says in the scripture that Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf, 2 Corinthians 5, 15. So becoming a Christian means we're no longer living for ourselves. We give the seat of lordship in our lives to God. So, some other things about sin. Theologians call this nature that's inclined to sin depravity. Depravity doesn't mean that you will commit every possible form of sin. But it does mean we have an inclination towards sin that will result in choices that we know are contrary to what God wants. There are some kinds of sin that in all likelihood I will never commit, just like in all likelihood there are some kinds that you would never commit. No matter how low the offerings get, I will never be tempted to walk into PNC Bank with a rifle and rob the bank. That, I guarantee you, that sin has absolutely zero place in my motives in my heart. Zero place. So depravity doesn't mean that we will commit every possible form of sin, but it does mean that inside of us is a depravity that will put our convenience ahead of what we know is right at times. De depravity describes the callous disregard for what is right and best for others to serve our own evil desires. This callous disregard leads to evil doing against God and adversely affects others. Romans 1.32 is a, a description of this. Although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So, another aspect of sin is guilt. Sin causes separation. Isaiah 59, verse 2, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Guilt is a moral reality that a person experiences when they realize they've compromised a moral standard or law. Guilt is a recognition of being accountable for a personal failure. So in the Bible, guilt seems to have two presuppositions behind it. The first presupposition is human beings are responsible and accountable for their actions, their thoughts, and their attitudes. And the second is that these actions, thoughts, and attitudes constitute a state of guilt when relationships between people and God are broken because of sin. Biblical concept of guilt contains responsibility and accountability. We're accountable for what we do and the consequences of what we do. This accountability lies at the center of a biblical understanding of guilt. Guilt brings with it serious consequences such as separation from God and from our neighbors and there are specific penalties for sins that we may commit. When someone sins against you, it's hard to just open up your life to them again. 
Yet the Bible tells us that that's what we have to do, and it's the right thing to do. So sin also means this. It comes from a root that means deserving of punishment, the main Greek word that's translated guilt means deserving of punishment. And according to the Apostle Paul, all human beings stand guilty before God because it's only God's grace that guilt can be set aside and forgiveness can be granted to us. So when we hear the angel saying to Joseph that this Savior will save his people from their sins. This has a present application. It has a past application. And it has a future application. I was saved at about 15 when I asked Christ into my life and received forgiveness of my sins. I'm being saved today. As sometimes I continue to mess up, you can ask Charlene, and sometimes, believe it or not, I am in a bad mood. People tell me that they think I'm never in a bad mood. Well, it doesn't happen very often, but I, I can be gnarly at times. <laughs> I will be saved. One day, I'll be in heaven out of all this mess that's here on earth, eternally forever. So there are consequences to sin and there are consequences to receiving Christ as Savior. But judgment is the penalty for sins. That word penalty is an interesting word. Penalty means, in a biblical sense, the pain or loss directly inflicted by the lawgiver who is morally outraged by the offenses committed and demands retribution. I came across, I didn't write that, I came across it. I thought it was really, really great. That's what penalty is. The pain or loss directly inflicted by the lawgiver who is morally outraged by the offenses committed and demands retribution. God is just and the justifier, the Bible tells us. And that's the beauty of what Christ came to do. He didn't come to just say, oh, God doesn't care if you sinned. No, he came to say, God cares extremely much if you sin. But Christ came to pay the penalty for the guilt that each one of us has incurred in our lives. He came to save his people from their sins. I love uh, just a little re- rehash here. The consequences of sin are separation from God and others, guilt, judgment. Ultimately, sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. Physical death spiritual death, eternal death. But in thinking about Zechariah's prophecy, I'm going to go over to Luke here a little bit in chapter 1, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and accomplished redemption for us and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. From the beginning of sin in the human race, God began to tell about a Savior, a Messiah, a Redeemer who would come. And I noticed something here in this little verse. I can't tell you how many times I have read this verse in my life. Many, many, many times. 
But as I was meditating on the scriptures for Christmas this year, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, did you notice mouth is singular and prophets is plural? And that got me thinking. He didn't say as he spoke by the mouths of his holy prophets, and he didn't say as he spoke by the mouth of one prophet, he said, speaking of this Savior who would come, this salvation that we just heard about in the, you know, before verse 70, he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets. And it's, it's as if to say there was one message, there was one message through all the prophets. They said one thing. It was one mouth, although many prophets. It reminds me so much of one of my favorite passages, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. He's the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Everything that the prophet said, he's now spoken in one person, Christ. So it goes back, he spoke by the mouth, the the one singular message, a savior would be born who could change everything. From Adam in the Garden of Eden and the prophecy about the seed of the woman who would bruise the head of the serpent, all the way through the last message in the book of Malachi about the sunrise from on high who would come, people sitting in darkness, this glorious sunrise would come. It said one thing. There was one message. There was one real voice, one voice through all the prophets. A Savior is coming. And the angel comes to Joseph, and he says to him, He shall save his people from their sins. What does it mean to not be saved from our sins? It means if we go back and look at this, we continue in separation from God. Our guilt is never resolved. And because our guilt is never resolved, we face judgment from a creator who is morally outraged at the things that we have done wrong. We face his judgment, and his judgment has already been declared as death, physical, spiritual, eternal. That's everyone in this place. That's everyone in this world. You know, I love that song, uh, you know, Is He Worthy? Because it comes from Revelation chapter 5, and they were looking for who is worthy to take the seal and open its scrolls. God sealed it up, his purposes. He's the one who sealed it. No one was worthy. No one on the earth, under the earth. You know, and no one was worthy, including Mary, including Moses, including, you know, John the Baptist, no one was found worthy except a bloody lamb was found worthy. A lamb who had been sacrificed, still bearing the marks of crucifixion, could take that and eliminate these consequences of sin that every one of us, we're all in the same boat, every one of us outside of Christ, face these consequences, separation from God, guilt, judgment, death. I'm so thankful that Jesus came to save us from that. 
aren't you? He says in his prophecy, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. That word, knowledge of salvation, it doesn't mean academic, you know, school. Knowledge is a relational word. It means more the experience of salvation. Knowing, the personally knowing what this salvation is all about. The church I grew up in gave an academic knowledge of it, but they didn't know how to lead you into a personal experience of it. So they could just talk about in academic terms. But Jesus came, and John the Baptist would give to his people this experiential knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of sins. And isn't that the amazing way that he saves his people from his sins, from their sins. He forgives us. And why can he forgive us? Because God's justice was satisfied when Christ bore the penalty for our sins. That's why he can forgive us. It's not God just saying, oh, run along, be good, I don't care. Doesn't matter. No, justice has been satisfied. The penalty has been paid. I'm going to ask Ed to make his way up because I've gone over my time already. But I remember uh, hearing a story, an analogy, somebody telling when we lived in England. And this guy would talk about for forgiveness of God in this kind of fashion. Let's just say you've committed a crime that is worthy of death, and you're guilty, and you know it, and everyone else knows it. You are guilty, and the death penalty is the judgment for what you have done. So you're standing before the, the judge, and he's about to give you his verdict you know you deserve the death penalty. And the judge says to you, if you are willing, I will take your place and pay the penalty that you deserve. You know, who in their right mind would say, I, I have to think about it. Maybe later in life, you know, anyone in their right mind would say, that is the most unbelievable offer in the entire world, and why would you do it? Why would you do such a thing? You had nothing to do with this. I had everything to do with it. Why would you take my place and take the death penalty that I earned? And the judge would just say, I love you. He came to save his people from their sins. I know everyone in this room has experienced that. But there may be someone online who hasn't. And you've wondered about this Jesus and what it's all about. Why did he come? He came because, like me, you are guilty before a holy God. And the consequences of that guilt are significant. There's separation. There's guilt. There's judgment. There's death. But the gift of God is eternal life, and he came to save you from your sins, to give to you the experiential knowledge of being enveloped by the love of God, by the forgiveness of your sins because the Creator took your place upon the cross because He loves you. And I just want you to pray with me. Dear Lord God, 
I want to thank you this Christmas that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. And I ask you to save me this morning. I ask your forgiveness, Lord. I don't want to live in rebellion against you. I don't want to follow that self-centeredness, that, that callous disregard for what I know you want and what is right in my relationships with other people. I turn, Lord, forgive me. I put aside things that are not compatible with walking with you. And I receive your forgiveness. And Lord, help me to learn to experientially live in the salvation that you have provided. I give you my life this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful he came to forgive his people from their sins? Amen. Thank you, Lord.